Okay, let's go ahead and get started. If you're watching this video, that means you've already read through the chapter, chapter one, the history of health insurance in the United States, and you've gone through the PowerPoint. Now, I tried to use a, a program called Timeliner and was not very impressed with it. I was going to tie to try to tie together uh, 7-Eleven and, and add a little bit for the uh, comprehensive exam because a lot of this material overlaps, but it uh, didn't work out real well. But I'm still going to use the slides and uh, you know for this particular presentation because it took me quite a while to work with Timeliner. Anyway, I'm going to give you the history from about 1890 up until uh, the 1940s when um, World War II started. So let's go ahead and get going. I think I missed a formal introduction because I was frustrated with Timeliner. I'm Rick Cates and this is the history of health insurance up until the 1940s. The reconstitution of the hospital is a term used by Starr and I noticed that in our book Morrissey quotes Starr quite a bit. But if you look back in history and look at the, um, the mid-1800s, hospitals were primary religious and charitable organizations that tended to the, to the sick rather than full-fledged medical institutions. Then in 1870 through about 1910, hospitals began to change, particularly with the, um, the founding of Johns Hopkins University. And hospitals then became the center of medical education and medical practice. As hospitals changed, their costs and overhead increased. At the turn of the century, in 1900, Roosevelt was president and he was going through what's referred to as the progressive era and so what had happened is big business or during this industrial revolution companies had gotten uh, very monopolistic so he had antitrust enforcement so he had to break up some of these companies uh, including uh, manufacturing transportation some of the big oil companies states were also dealing with the fallout of the industrial revolution they were shortening work weeks and and limiting child labor and and controlling workplace injuries and so what was happening was that employees were getting injured on the job uh, the company was blaming the employee and was kind of left out in the cold and this is what led to workers compensation insurance between 1910 and 1915 some 32 states enacted workers' compensation laws. And under these laws, employers accepted full liability for workplace injuries. In exchange, they were able to buy insurance coverage through the states. In the beginning, the American Medical Association supported workers' compensation laws because the physicians felt that the patients would get injured and then come to them for treatment. But in reality, some of the companies would retain their own doctor or hire a doctor and treat their employees thus leaving the physicians out in the cold who previously had these patients so the AMA reversed their decision about five years later and said no this violates uh, doctor-patient uh, relationships so at this point we've seen a change in the hospital structure we've seen a change in big business with the industrial revolution some of the companies being broken up and having to uh, provide workers compensation insurance and now to make matters worse the country has a great depression in 1929 but the depression was a catalyst for present-day insurance because what happened was hospitals was they were not making the revenue that they needed to so they had to figure out a way to pay for insurance and to pay for these hospital bills and so a gentleman named Justin Kimball the administrator of Baylor University devised a means to pay for hospital care so what he did was he had enrolled 1250 um, Dallas public school teachers into what he called the Baylor plan and each one of those individuals paid 50 cents a month with a promise to be provided 21 days of care in the hospital the Baylor plan spread rapidly uh, among hospitals and the American Hospital Association quickly grasped the plan and later on developed the um, the AHA Blue Cross Commission in 1946. What also fueled Blue Cross Blue Shield is that the plans were all nonprofit. Uh, they covered hospital charges only and allowed for a free choice of physician. 
therefore guess whose support you have the American uh, Medical Association and also they had exclusive geographic uh, market areas and even today uh, Blue Cross has some exclusive markets another important event which kind of lays the groundwork for health maintenance organizations or HMOs was in 1933 Dr. Sidney Garfield established the Kaiser Foundation and what was different about it is he was paying physicians a salary and this caused a big uproar with the AMA because it disrupted their sliding fee scale and therefore cut into their profits well later on the conflict was resolved once the uh, you know the uh, federal government stepped in and enforced the Sherman Antitrust Act sadly um, the Kaiser Foundation and other health organizations at that time that were paying salaried physicians struggled for almost 10 years until the uh, Supreme Court held against the AMA in 1943. As I mentioned before, the AMA supported the uh, hospital plans uh, established by the Blue Cross because they were allowed to uh, pick the physician and choose their physician. The next segment or presentation for Chapter 1 will deal with some of the changes that happened with uh, World War II in 1941 and we'll talk a little bit about price controls, how organized labor became a, a bigger player overall as far as getting more insurance and then some of the tax structure and federal tax codes that changed during that time frame.